G-Funk basically creates a whole new genre, a whole new vibe, um, a whole new music, gives it a name, and bases a lot of, a lot of the aesthetics on, on um, P-Funk music. Not to the extent, but in, within the context of early 90s LA, you know, um, black culture primarily, right? And um, that's really important, right? Because they, they, you know, Dre couldn't come, they couldn't come out in G funk, um, you know, rocking, you know, um, you know, leather vests and makeup and stuff. You know, they 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 created their own style, you know, um, as part of their party vibe, you know. But they took those aesthetics of P funk and they flipped it into early '90s LA aesthetics, right? Um, some of the other like defining elements, you know, and, and crossover elements before G, between G and P funk is, um, you know, using synths, whether they're sampled or they're interpolated uh, melodies, like replaying melodies from uh, Ohio players or replaying, um, you know, melodies from Leon Haywood or from P funk and George Clinton themselves. Um, you know, uh, again, drums and and were also often interpolated or sampled, and lyrics were often interpolated. So, um, you know, if we listen to Snoop Dogg, What's My Name, you know, Who Am I, What's My Name, um, it interpolates lyrics, so uh, from um, Atomic Dog by George Clinton. So, um, you know, when it goes... Well, George Clinton was... You know what I'm saying? And so, um, that's an interpolation, meaning like, you know, Snoop couldn't just use that, you know, Snoop Dogg, you know, in the, in the same way as Atomic Dog because it would be a copyright infringement. But interpolation means, you know, you take that small bit of lyrical and melodic um, elements and you just use that small portion, but you do your own recording, your own recording of it versus actually sampling the, um, the, the sound recording itself. So you didn't sample George Clinton singing Atomic Dog you sampled part of his songwriting um, and compositions and lyrics to do, you know, Snoop Doggy Dog. Um, anyways, um, but like I said, like the most important thing that G Funk sampled, other than you know the musical, you know, parts, uh, was basically the culture. This party feel good culture, um, you know. And that's huge, you know, and, and what P-Funk pu pushed was basically, let's party on the mothership, one nation under a groove, you know, and, you know, they had the mothership, you know, the, 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 the spaceship that would land down on the stage and they'd get out. And the, the, the spaceship for G-Funk music was the 6-4 Impala. Truly, in so in so many ways, right? That's the mothership. Is the car, you know, six four Impala, but whatever, low rider, you know, um, you know, car like that was really the mothership for um, G funk music. And I mean, you just have you know so many scenes in the music videos in those cars, you know, where they arrive in those cars, and it's just like P funk arriving in the mothership, you know. So if you read Williams' chapter, Jeep Beats, um, or didn't, I suggest you do, um, you know, it really goes through all, a lot of this. And one of the main points, I'll hit on some of the main points from the chapter. The main points is that um, G-Funk and Dre, um, you know, um, basically, you know, because people spend so much time in, in their cars in Los Angeles driving to get to places, driving for three hours to get five miles or whatever it is, um, G-Funk artists and producers made their music so it sounded damn good in a vehicle, okay? It was made, it was car music, okay? Whereas the East Coast, how do people get around in New York City? They don't have no cars. You know, most people in New York City don't have no cars. 
they take the subway, they take buses, whatever, right? And there ain't no public transportation in Los Angeles, right? There ain't no really good public transportation in Los Angeles. So the East Coast, how did people listen to music? Well, they didn't listen in a car, they listened in headphones. So that's the, the, the difference in prioritization on fidelity was for like RZA, you know, uh, Pete Rock, you know, all these dudes is like, they were making music so it would sound good in your phones. I mean, obviously you had cars and stuff and it sounded good in the cars, but the, like the way that people consumed the New York shit versus how people consumed and listened to the G-Funk and West Coast stuff was the difference in transportation, solitary listening in your headphones versus playing it as loud as you can where, to the point where it sounds good, um, you know, as long as it sounds good um, uh, on the West Coast. So, um, you know, we know that Driving is a major part of living in Los Angeles for y'all who are from there or been through there. And we know that car culture, um, you know, um, particularly in uh, uh, black and Latino uh, populations in Los Angeles, you know, of, of like customization of, of vehicles is like a, ma is a major, major, um, you know, part of Los Angeles uh, culture, you know, and you can also look at that and, and it's ethnic and racial um, characteristics to it, to it as well, which, with, which is what Williams looks at and talks about um, in, in, his, in his chapter. Um, but yeah, like, you know, the way that the sound was made, the emphasis on the bass, and this other technical element is why do, why do people have, you know, subwoofers, right? Well, it's for your bass to sound loud, but like I said previously, um, you know, you need to cancel out the, the, the low end of driving noise. That usually typically happens at the frequency of about 100 to 200 hertz, so pretty low frequency, but not that low. So you need a loud sub to emphasize the bass so that it doesn't get um, canceled out um, you know, by the driving noise. Another major thing that he talks about in this chapter is Dr. Dre's production technique. Basically, Dre barely sampled from records. He very, very, very rarely put a record on the turntable, sampled it, made a loop, um, you know, whatever. Um, he did a little bit more of that in NWA and then moved a little bit on from that later. And it was partly two reasons, right? Um, he would use records for ideas. So he'd listen to, you know, a uh, P-Funk record or George, um, George Clinton record or Roy Ayers record or whatever, and he'd, he'd get ideas from it, you know, he'd use it for ideas. But the main thing is he would literally, he would get um, what's, what's called a, a compulsory mechanical license. It's basically a license for you to do a cover version. So if you want to record a cover version of, of a song, this goes for anybody, you get a compulsory mechanical license. And it basically, as long as the song has been published and is out there and you don't change anything uh, in the song, um, you can get a license without permission. You just have to notify the publisher, pay the licensing fees, and you can record a cover version. Um, Dr. Dre would get that type of license, get a session band to come in and do a session where they played these songs that he licensed. Then Dr. Dre would own the master recordings. He would own those cover versions. He'd still have to pay and credit the authors, let's say George Clinton or whoever wrote the song they did a cover version of, but they didn't have to pay Dre's, um, uh, George Clinton's record label, whether it be Capitol or Westbound or whatever record label. Um, Dre took the record label out of that equation. And so he would, he would record um, a cover version. He'd sample from that um, and he'd use small bits from that in the process of interpolation. Like I said, he would replay drum breaks using different drum sounds, um, and he used the mini Mo uh, mini Moog a lot. Um, and one of the things this allowed for two things. Number one, it allowed him to avoid paying master use licenses, which are when you sample a sound recording, you have to pay a master use license for the sound recording. Okay, it's called a master use license. It allows you to use someone's sound recording. Then you would have to get a mechanical license from whoever wrote the, um, wrote the song or composed the lyrics, because within a piece of music, there's two copyrights, and they're usually discrete. 
whoever wrote the music or composed the, um, the music and whoever owns the recording on that. And you need to get promotion, permission and pay both of those entities. Dr. Dre, through interpolation, figured out how to cut out the record label. So it's a business thing, and that's one of actually Dr. Dre's gen you know, greatest contributions is his business mind. After he got fucked over in NWA, you know, he took those lessons here. The other thing is that by having a band come in and record you know, a session and record songs is you could have the guitar on its own track, which means you could manipulate the guitar levels and process them however you want. You could have the bass line on its own track, which means you can manipulate it in whatever way that you wanted. Um, you, know, um, you, you could have all of the elements, the drums, every piece could be on its own track, which would basically mean it was discrete. So whereas Paul C is panning drums out of the signal, Dr. Dre already has basically everything on its, on its own track, it's all separated, so he could grab and shape and sculpt the sound however he wanted, and he, he didn't have to rely on the record. You know, part of the thing for a lot of um, beat makers was they liked the sound of the record. They liked the challenge of sampling from a record, or it's what, whatever they had. You know, Dre figured out a little way around, around that the, for both business reasons and also uh, for control reasons, for sonic reasons, you know, and that's a major, major thing that, that he did. But yeah, in G-Funk, the mothership equivalent is the car, the three-wheel motion, um, you know, low rider, whatever, six-foam Paula, uh, 